We are in a series about doing Christmas God's way, not the way of the world or the way of culture, but we are doing it in the sense of celebrating the birth of Christ in God's way, according to what the scripture says versus what the culture around us says is the best way. And it appears that nowadays, something that happens that's very important now is absolutely incidental later on. This majoring on the very minor things and replacing the important for the insignificant things seems to be a defining characteristic of what humans are like all over the world. They think things are important now and they put their life towards that now, but later on they realize that it's really not that important as it was when we thought it was so important before. We start to understand that there are more important things possibly that are going around the world that should be more significant. And we should put more of our efforts towards those things and not the things that we're so adamant about at the time. Never had this been seen so obviously as it is when people celebrate Christmas all over the world. Christmas time is a time of cheer and a time of giving and what they call the Christmas spirit. That, of course, is the way the world does Christmas, not the way that we should do Christmas as Christians. What is essential turns out to be really incidental. And what is so important seems to be put down and we want to reverse that this year in our hearts if you could think about what life was like in the year 1809 the newscasters if there was any newscasters back then cnn or nsbc or whatever the news the biggest news in 1809 would be the most significant they would think would be Napoleon sweeping across the plains of Austria and taking over that country. That would be headlines everywhere. And all talk throughout the known world was that Austria was going to fall under the grips of Napoleon. And it was so significant. Everyone in 1809 was talking about the invasion by Napoleon of Austria. That was significant at the time. But incidentally, there were a few babies that were being born in the year 1809. And nobody really paid attention to babies being born. Everybody's mind was set on the invasion of Austria. Nobody paid attention to some of the babies that were born in 1809. But if you thought about who was born that year and the significance that they would have in the whole world, maybe you would pay attention. For example, it seems to me that someone should have paid attention to William Gaston was born in Liverpool. And he became one of the most famous influential prime ministers of all of Great Britain through the whole history of that country. To the Tennyson family in 1809, in Lincolnshire, their fourth son was born, Alfred, who became England's most famous poet who wrote literature that helped the hearts of so many in the 19th century. Across the Atlantic in my country, Oliver Wendell Holmes drew his first breath in 1809. Nobody paid attention, and yet he graduated from Harvard. It was an MD who advanced medicine beyond what we could even imagine. Not far away in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe was born in 1809. Very insignificant, but yet became famous throughout the world for his poetry as well. The same year, a physician and his wife, last name was Darwin, had a baby boy. His name was Charles. Charles Darwin, who turned the world upside down with his 
origins of the species and his theory of evolution. Also born was Robert Charles Winthorpe in 1809 and later became a member of House of Representatives in the United States and was a very famous statesman. Oh, I, I should remember down in rugged Kentucky. In 1809, in a little teeny cabin, was born from Thomas and his wife, Nancy, and they named his son Abraham. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809. No one cared about babies in the crib. Nobody thought about people being born as important. Because everyone's eyes was on Napoleon, the big war in Austria. Isn't it interesting that after the passing of time, nobody really thinks about the invasion of Austria by Napoleon? But it was world news then. You history buffs might think it's exciting, but do you guys think it's exciting? Come on. Is it, oh, Napoleon invaded Austria. Oh, no, you, you, you don't think it's exciting either. We realized, looking back, that what was more significant were the people that were born that year and what they accomplished. The world would never seem to understand or even think about who was born that year. Travel back with me to the same kind of situation that was happening in Rome. All talk was on a man named Caius Octavius, who took the name Augustus. That's easy to remember. Augustus Caesar, who reigned from the year 27 BC to AD 14, and reigned over the known world at the time bounded by the west, by the Atlantic, and the north by the Danube, the rain, and all the way to the Sahara in the south, Rome was a vast, vast empire. And every eye was on Rome and Augustus on the throne. And what would he do? What would life be like under this reigning monarch, this emperor? Because he was so into himself, he decried for a tax that everyone would give money to him. Taxes were on the rise. Who really cared about the land of Palestine or a little boy, someone born in a cave? And how would the couple who was the father and the mother, how would they make it 90 miles, a journey from Nazareth all the way to the little village outside of the city of Jerusalem, a little teeny town, a very small, small, insignificant town, Bethlehem. I'm so excited because in the next couple weeks, just after everyone celebrates Christmas, my wife and I will visit the small little town of Bethlehem. We get to go, and we are so very excited about our tour in the Holy Land, and we will be in Bethlehem right after Christmas. But I want you to know, even now, Bethlehem is outside of the city of Jerusalem, and it still is a little teeny dump of a town. It's an insignificant little place in light of Jerusalem. And no one in Rome could care less about a little baby born outside in a small little town that had few houses was really insignificant. Augustus, who made the edict, didn't know, and he didn't have any idea that centuries later, the course of passing of time, this baby, this baby born in a cake and laid in a feeding trough from a very poor family would be the most significant person ever, ever to be born on this whole planet. No other person in history has influenced the world for good more than Jesus. His life and his message have greatly changed the lives of so many millions people and nations. History is his story. And the story of the life of this one man is the most significant story ever. 
remove Jesus of Nazareth from history, and it would be completely, completely devastating. Charles Spurgeon, an English theologian, wrote this, Christ is the great central fact in the world's history. To him, everything looks forward or backward. All the lines of history converge upon him. All the great purposes of God culminates in him. The greatest and the most momentous fact which the history of the world records is a little baby born in Bethlehem. But that moment seems altogether insignificant at the time. We spend our lives like that sometimes, don't we? In some ways, we focus on the things that are so exciting for the day, the report of news like now, what's going on in the world, or what's going on in my life. And the media brings stories after stories that make us try to be excited about events that are happening now. But I promise you, most of these things are very, very insignificant. The world at Christmas season, this wonderful season of Christmas cheer, you know, the spirit of Christmas, and the world still doesn't understand the significance. It sings songs and Christmas carols, strives to have that spirit of Christmas and give presents and good cheer and be happy and give to someone else. And if you give to someone else who needs it, you have that spirit of Christmas. Joy to the world. They sing it at Central Bangna. Even in the elevators and around. Christmas carols. Joy to the world. The Lord is and in the hustle and the bustle, everyone's running around and buying these big baskets of food and things to give to people and you hear and you see them buying all the presents and you see people even in, in Central and in Mega and all these stores and they're wrapping all the presents and they're hearing the Christmas carols even on the speakers in, in the mall. They're singing joy to the world. The Lord has come. But they don't understand that. They don't see the significance. They're more they're more focused on the present that they want to give to someone else. The most significant message in all the world has happened. And the world is focusing on Christmas, but they don't focus on Christmas. They don't do Christmas God's way. They don't understand that the gift that they receive from God is Jesus himself. You guys ever watch this film here, this movie called Elf. It's very famous. It's actually kind of one of the most famous Christmas movies now. In this movie, it talks about how Christmas is, is lacking the spirit of Christmas. And then the spirit of Christmas comes when people believe in Santa. And when they believe in Santa, the spirit of Christmas starts to come farther and more and more and builds up. Actually, the spirit of Christmas is the power that runs Santa's sleigh to deliver all the presents to all the needy, the wonderful kids waiting on Christmas morning to open up their presents. So meaningful, right? So moving in our hearts, right? No, that's not Christmas God's way. I remember when I was a little boy, I was excited about opening up a present. I had my mom and my dad, they bought me what I wanted for Christmas. It was the big wheel. And that's a picture of the big wheel. It was so exciting. And I opened it up and I was so, so happy because of my present. But this Christmas, would we not want to focus on the real gift? The essential, not the incidental. That big wheel for me was happy and fun for a few months, maybe even six months. But then I didn't care that much about it. In Luke chapter 2, a very familiar story 
We just sang about it. I want us to look at the Christmas story, God's way, fresh and new. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field and keeping their watch over their flock by night. This is a very common occurrence back then. Shepherds banded together, they brought their sheep together, their flocks came together during the night because it was easier for them to watch and to protect their sheep. So different shepherds would come and they would have a meeting place and they would bring all of their sheep with them and they would band together and put the sheep all together and in the morning all the shepherd would need to do is to call out his sheep and his sheep would follow him and the other shepherds would make his call and the, the sound of their shepherd's voice and they would go in that direction and follow their shepherd. Protecting the sheep was a full-time job. So at night, the shepherds would bring them together, they would protect them, and that was very, very normal. In fact, it was so normal that this may be the exact same field that David, many hundreds of years prior, King David tended his sheep on these exact same hills something very unusual happened. It wasn't a normal night. The shepherds were on the hill and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Now, into this normal night with the normal shepherds gathering the sheep came a very abnormal event. An angel appeared. And the word appear in the Greek means not just like it kind of showed up. It indicates that there was an explosion in the sky. Boom! The angel now was there before them in a very dramatic way. Now we're not sure exactly what the angel looked like. In fact, scripture usually describes angels as more looking like humans in appearance and sometimes some mistakenly took angels as people but this time the angel was unmistakably amazing with the glory of the Lord appearing with him now the glory of the Lord is referring to the same passage as we read in the Old Testament when Moses asked God, can I see your glory? And God said, nobody sees my glory and lives. Moses had to be shielded in the rock and God passed over. And the backside, in other words, the residual part of God's glory was shown to Moses so that he could live. But this time it says that the angel appeared and with the angel was what? The glory of the Lord. This bright, I don't know, I, I had never seen it, so I don't know how to describe it, but I'm sure it was a bright, incredibly beautiful sight. I, I don't know, and shepherds, when they saw the angel, what did they do? And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Now, this word terribly frightened means mega frightened, like mega bangna. It's not just a small shopping mall, it's a mega shopping mall. And so when they say mega, means that they were terrified. They could not be more scared Scared to death is what people say nowadays. They were completely and totally frightened. And you would be too, you think? 
Hello? The explosion of the angel, the great glory, suddenly you're just kind of sitting there watching your sheep. And then, boom! Very, very scared. But the angel said, don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, the question I have, why shepherds? Why would God, in the very point in time, when he sends this angel to announce the most important message of all the world, why would he appear to shepherds? There seems to be a lot more appropriate people that he could give this message to. I mean, what about King Herod, uh, the political leader, the ruler of the town and the area? Or what about the high priest? I mean, he was the person who was supposed to represent God to the people. What about Caesar himself? I mean, he was the emperor of all of Rome. Why didn't the imperial ruler be the one that the angel showed up for? Why was it, why was it shepherds? It's a good question. I have that question, and I, I really want to know the answer to that. One day, I'm going to try to find in heaven the actual shepherds that saw and say, hey, just interview them, right? Like, what, what happened, and what did you see? But there's so many other people that could have been the ones that received the message. You see, shepherds, and everyone thought shepherds were irreligious people. They didn't go to church. Because of their work and their schedule, it kept them from the synagogues. It kept them from all the religious ceremonies. All the religious festivals, when they would walk up to the big mountain and on Jerusalem and get close to the Holy of Holies and all that, the sacrificial systems, and they came closer to God. The shepherds never had a chance to do that. Because they were full-time working in the fields. Now, we have some members of our church that sometimes can't come to church because they have to work on Sundays. But these people, all the time, they, they didn't hang around any of the other people. They were loners, and the only people they really knew were the other shepherds when the, at night when they brought these sheep. Or when they go in the market and then they would take the sheep with them so that they could sell the sheep. But then they'd have to go right back on the mountain. They were irreligious people. Why would God appear to them? Any ideas? And so I begin to wonder this. I ask the question to myself, who else in the Christmas story did God appear to? Remember the other significant group in the Christmas story? We three kings of Orion. The, the wise men, right? The Magi. This is a significant group of people because they were wise men. Do you remember the story about the wise men? They came from the east, which means that they were not Jewish they were Gentiles. Christ is the Messiah for the Jews. But God shows the star to the Gentile to follow to find out where Jesus was born. Hmm. Why would he do that? Now, Magi were some kind of people that studied the stars. They were philosophers. They weren't even religious people. I'm trying to figure out what exactly life is all about. These Gentile philosophers. They weren't churchgoers. These men were the ones who saw the star and they went after it. Who else met Jesus in the Christmas story? Well, remember the old guy? The old guy in the temple? After eight days when Jesus was born, they, they took him to the temple of God. He was greeted there by this old, old man. He wasn't the chief priest. They didn't go to the 
temple and they brought baby Jesus and all of a sudden everybody broke out singing praise to God, Messiah is here, Hosanna, Hosanna. This is the savior of the world. None of that happened, it was quiet. This old dude named Simeon comes up and says, oh my goodness, there he is. One guy recognizes the Messiah and then when he sees baby Jesus, another old person, an old lady comes up and she's 86 years old, a widow who her name is Anna and she comes up. So two people unknown in all the Bible, nobody knows who they are. They're the ones who greet Jesus at the temple. And why, why is God then, why is he making his big announcement, his splash into the world the significance of the message that Jesus is here. Why is he showing up and the angels announce it and the people who know are not the people you'd think? I think the answer lies in the verse itself. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for what all the people which will be just for the important people no will be only for the kings and the rulers of this world no it will only be for those who are really religious and devout no it will only be for the wealthy and the well deserved no, the scripture says it will be for all the people. The good news included everybody. And so the significance of the angel announcing to the irreligious, dirty shepherds that nobody really wanted to hang around with, the Gentile people who aren't even religious at all, and the old person who in those days, they were just kind of standing around and nobody looked at them as significant. The good news is for the shepherds and for the Gentiles and for the old people and for Thai people and for Filipino people. Yeah, even the Filipino people. And for us Americans and Africans. And the Bible says he's for all the people. God's gift came for everyone. Normal, normal people like us. Do you feel that God came for you, a normal person? The common people. I think we're pretty common. I mean, when I walked in, nobody showed up with a whole bunch of cameras taking pictures of me like a celebrity. God's Son came for everyone. And if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Ray, I am not good enough for such a wonderful gift. You don't know my life. You don't know what I have done. You don't know the sin that I do. You don't know how weak I am. You don't know how insignificant I am in this place, in this earth. You really don't know my heart. You don't know how bad I am. I'm here to tell you that the gift of God's Son, no matter how you feel about who you are, is for you. It's for everyone. God loves each person here no matter what. No matter how rich you are or how poor you are or how sinful you are. No matter how naughty or nice. No matter if you're from a Buddhist background or from a Muslim or, or Hindu or even if you even if you could care less about God in the past. You see, we were all enemies of God. All of us. We all at one time could care less about God and Jesus. But he wants you to know that the gift is for everyone. And when I say all the people and everyone, it includes you and me.
Remember how I said I hope that you can make Jesus and Christmas come closer and closer to your heart so that this year it feels special. I want you to say as an act of will, not as, a, not as an emotional response, I want you to say as an act of your will, Jesus came for me. Came for me. No matter how I am, the gift was given to me. Not only is God's Son for everybody, but God's Son came to save us. We've been talking about this so much, and I don't mind telling you it all over again. The present for Christmas is a Savior. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which is for what? All the people, everyone, for today in the city of David there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, I want to read this because in English the translation is really not, it doesn't bring out the significance of the words of what has been announced. It's not really that clear, but... I am going to translate this in the way that the shepherds heard it. In English, for us. Does that make sense? It's like this. For he is born to you. He's born to you. In other words, it's for you. It's for you. Today. Right, right now. <laughs> He, it's for you right now today. He's been born for you right at this moment. Can you imagine that? Just stop right there. What? He's born for you. You are the reason. And it happened today, right now. Can you see how excited they would be? And then they were going like, what, if, what is it? <laughs> what, what, what is it? And then they say, a savior. A rescuer has been born for you today. Who is the long-awaited one? The Messiah, the Christ. God himself has come for you. God came for you today. This is what they hear. So if we read it so fast, don't be afraid. For you, for you in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You say, oh, okay, 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 okay. But let's stop and let's really understand the message here. A Savior has been born for you, for me, today, who's a rescuer, one who snatches you from peril. He is a, a rescuer, a Savior. So just like the floodwaters, the raging floodwaters of sin and of God's wrath, and you're barely holding on to the tree. And if you don't have anybody to come and take you out of that, you are going to die. You're holding on as much as, much as you can, and, and you have a lot of sin, and God is judging you, and, and the judgment of God is there because He is a holy God. And you're holding on, and you need somebody to take you out of that. He comes as the Savior. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. So you're in this water, this massive flood, and you're barely holding on, and you're tired, and you can't hold on anymore because your sin is so heavy and God is holy. And then all of a sudden, here comes this man, and he's got a rope, and he grabs you, and you're going to say to him, get away from me. No. You're going to do what? You're going to grab onto him, and you're going to receive him, and you're going to hold on with all your heart and all your mind because you know he is the one who's going to take you out of the flood. And so this morning we have to understand that this is what the shepherds heard. They heard that someone is going to save them from their sins. And we need to hear that this morning for us. 
that he came for you today. A Savior. And we need to receive that gift and say, yes, Lord, I, I believe that. I trust that. He is for me, and without him, I don't have any hope to get out of this. Except a gift today. For He is born to you. A Savior. He's a Savior. Christmas is not about the Christmas spirit. Christmas is not about giving gifts and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Christmas is about the peace that God has given man. It's a vertical peace. It's a peace between you and God. That's what Christmas is about. And we, yeah, we express that to others around us. But the significant part about Christmas is that Jesus was born a Savior to save you and give peace to you between the holy God who is holy and you who is sinful. And He rescues you from that. In fact, in the time of Jesus' birth, the Romans issued a Roman decree. It was the propaganda for all of the Roman Empire. It's called Pax Romana. Have you heard of Pax Romana? Which means peace of Rome. The propaganda would go like Rome turned out all the provinces and said, We and our armies will provide peace and stability in your world now. You won't have to worry about any other people coming in and trying to take your life away. Because the peace of Rome, we will stabilize all wars because we will be your protectors. The Pax Romana. Apicius, a Greek philosopher, wrote this when he heard this great propaganda. He said this, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he's unable to give peace from passion and grief and envy. He cannot give peace of heart, for which man yearns for more than even outward peace is an inner peace. It's true. You see, people are hurting all over this world. They're hurting around you. People you know when you go to work. People you know in your apartment complex. People are hurting. And they need an inner peace. Jesus has provided peace for us in our hearts. And that's why we say, go tell it on the mountain. Just like the shepherds. Because you see, God brought a rescuer for us. He was born to you today. A Savior who is the rescuer who is God, and he has provided this for you. Lastly, God's son calls for a response. In other words, there should be some type of response, right? You heard all these good news. For you, today, a Savior, the Messiah, God himself came for you. And what do we do? We just sit back. We don't think about it. We go out our normal day. No. We respond to it. We say, Lord, this is what you did for me? Okay. If you did this for me, if you really, really did this for me, I'm going to give you my life. What was the response of the angel, the angels? Everyone who came in contact with this good news had a response. So what was the response of the angels? Well, suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, an army of angels praising God. Praising God. When the news came, the angels rushed to that place and they praised God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. For me, the response of the angel and the angels to me is the most significant indicator for what Christmas is all about. 
And let me tell you what. I mean, I can see shepherds getting really excited about the good news. I can see that. But angels see people all the time. What was exciting to the angels was something incredibly miraculous happened. You see, they saw God on His throne from all creation. When they were created, they saw God in all His glory. And they were with Him. And they praised Him. And God, the one they knew so intimately, much more than we could ever know to think of at this point, God whose presence they were in, standing under His throne day and night, the God whose power they saw, the glory they praised, the God was becoming a baby to save people. And the angels freaked out. <laughs> They're like, he didn't do that for the angels. No. He, he did that for men. He did that for us. The angels saw that God became a man to save man. And I'm sure they were marveled. They were so astonished that one moment they saw God on his throne, and the next moment they saw God as a baby in a manger. And they just couldn't help it. They flew, I don't know how they traveled, but they got to that place. And they got in front of those shepherds and they just started praising God so much because God came down as Emmanuel, God with us. It's amazing. An amazing present that God from eternity past who created all of heaven and earth would come down as flesh for us, as a present for Christmas. God with us, Emmanuel. Glory to God in the heights, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. And when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, now we see the shepherds' response. The shepherds began saying to one another, uh, Let's go! Let us go straight to Bethlehem then! And see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. In other words, they ran and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he laid in the manger. They responded. They had to go find him. They had to find out where, where he was. Where is he? Let's, let's go see Let's run to Him. Let's see this gift that God has given to us today. First they sought and ran to look for Him. <laughs> they ran to Bethlehem and they went to every place they could. And then they saw. And then they found Him. They found Him. And then what did they do? They began to tell everyone and everybody what they saw. Then they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the Christ, the child, and all who heard it wondered these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondering them in her heart. As Mary heard another message from the angel. The angel appeared to Mary and said, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And when Mary heard what happened from the shepherds, she said, Oh, this is my son. This is my son. God came for me. The shepherds went back glorifying. What's the last thing they did? They praised and glorified, praising God for what they had heard and seen, just as it's been told them. Now, if I would say to you, whatever happened after that to the shepherds, 
Come on, theologians. Come on, Bible scholars. Everyone here. Teachers. What else do we have here? Okay. Student. What happened to the shepherds after this? Anyone know? What if I told you they became great missionaries? And they went to all the different countries of the world and, and they shared what they saw. What if I told you that? Would you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably what happened, right? It's not what happened. What happened to the shepherds? They went back to their sheep. What? Yeah, yeah. They, they went back to their job, to their sheep. Wait a minute here. Didn't they change? Didn't, didn't they have a response? When Jesus is in your heart, the change is in your heart. You take your heart back to where you were. You take your heart back to your school. That changed heart you take back to your workplace. You go back to where God's got you. And your heart is what changed. And the shepherds kept telling the story to the other shepherds that weren't there. Normal people with normal work, with normal lives. They didn't become great Billy Graham evangelists. They became shepherds. But they became shepherds with a changed heart. Not because of the spirit of Christmas, but because of the gift given to them. The gift was revealed. God's Son is for everyone. God's Son came to save us. And God's Son calls us to respond. So my question is, how are you going to respond? Let's pray together. Lord, you have revealed your gift. And you revealed it to the most unlikely people. Normal people. Irreligious and Gentile and old everyday type of people. Because you promised us that your son is for everyone. For it is not your desire that anyone would perish, but your gift was for those who would receive you. God's son came for us as Savior. Thank you for bringing Jesus as Savior for us. And thank you, God, that you called us to respond. And we pray, Lord, that today and every day, that we would have a heart that's changed and we would bring Jesus back to the people around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.